we're finished with the woodworking. We've completed the woodworking, and now is, we're ready to apply the finish. Windsors look the way they look because of their intended finish. The finish came first. Typically, when you make a project, the finish is your last decision. You decide, am I going to use varnish? Am I going to use lacquer, shellac, or oil and wax? Windsor chairs were intended to be used in everyday situations. They were a chair for public buildings, taverns, churches, meeting halls. In the house, they were used in the kitchen or on the front porch, and they frequently were used outside in the garden. That's heavy wear, often exposed to the elements. And there's only one finish that holds up under those circumstances, and that's paint. So before Windsor chairs came the paint. They were going to be painted because of their intended use, the niche that they were going to fill in people's daily lives. An opaque finish is going to channel your design decisions. One of the possibilities into which you will be channeled is that of the use of line. Now, line is different than, again, um, many pieces of furniture that you're used to making. Texture, the patterns in wood, are static. You look at them, you examine them, you appreciate them but there's no movement through texture. Line, on the other hand, is dynamic. Line picks up your eye and moves it from one place to another. But, when, but it's not a random process. When you work with line, you plan out the path that your eye is going to travel. So in other words, you're creating a composition when you're working with line. You're composing with line. Let me take you through this chair because it's a very typical composition in line as Windsor chair makers developed. As you approach the chair, as you make visual contact with the chair for the first time, there are three lines here in the center of the chair. Remember, we selected these spindles because they were the straightest of the spindles. Those three lines running almost parallel seize your eye and move it upward to the top of the chair. Here, your eye is taken over by a heavy line that slowly moves it along and then begins to accelerate it down into the chair. So when you encounter a Windsor chair, there's actually a movement through the chair that carries you through, causing you to see the whole chair. Your subconscious mind finds that very appealing. And that's why most people, upon encountering their first handmade Windsor chair, have the reaction, wow, nice chair. Now think about how often in your daily life you stop, examine a chair, and say, wow, nice chair, and you realize you don't encounter a lot of nice chairs. But it happens to me all the time. Why? Because when I'm making a Windsor chair, I'm consciously working with the design element of line, creating a composition. Now, we talked in the beginning of the sackback segment about Windsor chairs and why they are so appealing to us. We talked about their timeless designs, designs that have not changed in two and a half centuries, that have not been improved upon in two and a half centuries. And one of the reasons why they're not improved upon is the old guys knew what they were doing when they were working with line. Now, the other thing we talked about, or the other thing I talked about in the beginning, was the chair's strength. And we examined that as we made the chair, and we talked about its engineering. We likened it to a suspension bridge, tough, flexible, but thin pieces woven together into a web. The use of line directed the engineering choices that will get going to this chair, too. So an awful lot of what a Windsor chair is, its timeless appearance, its durability, is a result of the fact that it was going to be painted. The implication for us is that it's 
almost impossible to separate this chair from its intended finish. And if you try to, if you try to put a natural finish on the Windsor chair, there are a whole lot of unfortunate results that will undermine all the work that went into making the chair. Now, Windsor chairs, when they were developed, were not going to be painted just any color. There was a color that was in fashion at the time, and that was green. Windsor chairs were painted green for the first several decades in which they were made. They were painted green so commonly that the, the street name, the everyday name for a Windsor chair, was a green chair. People called them by their color. These were frequently just referred to as green chairs. And we have a lot of records of that uh, written uh, record of these being called green chairs by people in everyday situations. Now, the green pigment that was used to paint Windsor chairs was verdigris. Verdigris is obtained by exposing copper to a mild acid, frequently nothing more than vinegar. And you're familiar with that color because you see it on statues, you see it on copper pipes in your house. That was the pigment that was used to make green paint for Windsor chairs. Now there's a problem with verdigris, and that is that the pigment is fugitive. If exposed to light, it quickly darkens. When antique collectors began to collect antique Windsors around 1870, they looked at the early layers of paint and realized that it was a dark green. And that's the green they decided was the original Windsor green. But that's not what the chairs look like in the beginning. The original verdigris paint was similar to early foliage in the spring on a tree. when It's, it's a light, pale green. As verdigris darkens and becomes darker, it looks more like the foliage on a tree in the midsummer, the mature foliage of a tree. Here's the contrast between Windsor Green as it was first applied and the way it looked years later, the darker green that antique collectors found and determined was Windsor Green. In fact, it's often referred to as Windsor Green. But this is the way it looked in the beginning. The paint that was put on Windsor chairs was lead-based. It was linseed oil, white lead, and the verdigris pigment. Obviously, we can't use lead in paint today. It's toxic, and the government won't allow you to mix it up. When we finish our chair, I'm going to use milk paint. And this is the reason why. The early lead paints were a very complex and appealing finish. They weren't solid, opaque finishes like modern paints. They were, there were different, subtle differences in shade uh, and the ability to see uh, uh, even some of the wood underneath the, uh, the finish. I'm going to use milk paint because while it is not the original paint used by Windsor chair makers, it's the best simulation of the lead paints that were used in the early 18th century. It has the same complexity and shading. And above all, it wears the same way as did lead-based paints. And one of the reasons is that milk paint will soak into the, the, to the wood so that when it wears, it doesn't chip away like a modern paint peeling away. It actually wears to a feather edge. If to wish to finish your chair in the original color, the product you want is tavern green milk paint. If you want to paint your chair as it would be more thought of as Windsor Green, then the color you want is Lexington Green. I'm going to use Lexington Green because it's the color that most people associate with Windsor chairs.
before we can apply a finish, we want to prep the chair. The process of putting a chair together is, as you saw, pretty brutal. Uh, it's almost if the chair can survive being assembled, it'll survive being sat in. But the driving, the banging, pulling parts to line them up with their holes frequently scratches the surface of the, of the seat or other parts. It makes dings and it makes uh, uh, indentations. Some of those will get out with, uh, with water when we moisten the chair. But others will be deep enough that we want to fill them. And the filler that I use is plastic wood. And the reason I like this product is it takes the milk paint. Other wood fillers will not. They'll resist the milk paint. And water-based fillers will simply bubble up under the milk paint. So our uh, uh, plastic wood, natural color, is my filler of choice. And I'll just use this screwdriver as a spatula. And I'll use it to fill some dents. And I got a little one up here where the tenon didn't quite line up with the hole and ding the edge of the, the, of, the, of the hole. Okay, we'll let this sit now. If you have any small voids where the wedges didn't fill the joint completely, not a bad idea to put a little bit of filler in those as well. While we're waiting for the filler to dry, I'm going to take this opportunity to do some cleanup on the chair of loose fibers uh, and, uh, and, and strands of wood that may be uh, remaining from the assembly. Right here, for example, I'll trim off and clean up that. And a little bit up here. And over here. There we go. Now that the filler is dry, We'll sand it smooth. This is just a piece of 120 grit. You know that if you get the surface of a piece of wood wet, that as it dries, it's going to raise the grain. Milk paint is water-based, so as it dries, it is going to raise the grain of this chair. It's a lot of work to try and sand down a chair that's got its first coat of finish on it. So what we're going to do is cause the grain to raise in advance. And we're going to do so by spraying the chair with a mist of water. That will have a couple of advantages. First, it's going to raise the grain, but also any glue spills that are on this chair will show up. And it's important to get rid of those because glue will see seals the wood and will prevent the milk paint from bonding. So if there are glue spots on this chair, as you apply the milk paint, they're going to resist it and prevent the chair from being uniform. It's, it's going, they're going to show up afterwards and it's not going to look great. So we start misting down the chair. Now, we're really just misting the chair. It's not like we're washing the car. We don't want to get it dripping wet.
And so we can see glue spots. There's some here on this stump. We we'll want to get rid of those. There's another one down here. This one's pretty predictable. It fell from the, uh, uh, the, the stump tenon. And the way to remove those glue spots is with a scraper. Okay, our chair has dried after being moistened down and the grain has been raised and I can feel it. So I'm now going to do a light sanding with 120 grit paper. To reiterate, milk paint is different than any other finish you might have used. One of the differences is it comes as a powder and it has to be mixed with water to create the paint. The paint comes in a bag like this. And inside is a foil pouch, along with a set of instructions, which I can give you pretty well right now. You want to mix about half milk paint to half water. It's, easy if you, it's easier if you use a wide mouth jar. My all-time favorite is a salsa jar, and that's, what, and that's what this is. It's half full of water. Put in the milk paint, put on the cover, and just pretend you're a bartender making a vodka martini for James Bond. Shaken, not stirred. And there we go. The milk paint will froth up almost like whipped cream. Before you can use it, the air in it is going to have to disperse. The bubbles will break up and it will become a liquid. Then we can use it. So now what we're going to do is set it aside. That process will take maybe 45 minutes. While we're waiting for that to settle out, Seal up the bag again so that it's airtight. Moisture and milk paint don't get along well together. You can put it back together and store it again in a dry, cool place. A bag of milk paint will paint roughly two chairs with two coats. So you should be able to finish two chairs with one bag of milk paint. What I have here in the jar should be enough to do two coats on this chair. The foam is settled out of the milk paint and it's now ready to use. The milk paint contains some solids that will settle out. So you're going to need to stir it frequently. Keep a stick in the jar. As I stir it, it's about the consistency of light cream. I'm going to use a particular brush. It's one of those cheap dollar brushes that you can buy at the hardware store or the paint store made in China. The reason I'm using it is it has a natural bristle. Don't want to use a nylon bristle because it's not going to hold the paint, the water-based paint, the way the natural bristles will. The other nice thing about these is they're inexpensive and when you're done with them, you just toss them out. 
Now, applying milk paint is very different than any other paint you've used. Everything about milk paint is different. It's not difficult, it's just different. The paint is water-based. You can't flow it on the way you would a latex or an oil-based paint. You have to work it. It has to be worked into the wood. And so there's a lot of brush activity as you're applying this paint. You don't want any standing on, on the wood. If you try to flow it on the way you would an oil or a latex paint, you're doing it wrongly and you're not going to like the result. It has to be worked. Don't try to put too much paint or pick up too much paint with the brush. The other thing you'll notice is I'm wearing old clothes. Being water-based, the milk paint can create little tiny spatters. And you don't want to be wearing any clothes that uh, uh, that you'd want to be wearing for any other purpose. And now we'll just continue on. We paint the rest of the chair. There'll be an order. I like to get the undercarriage done first and then start at the top and work my way down to the seat. The seat is the last thing that I'll do. Okay, that wraps up the first coat. I'm going to set the chair aside to dry. You can see that where I started is already dry because this being a water-based paint, it doesn't take a long time. Now, just a word of, of, of caution here. The chair looks ratty. It looks like something the cat dragged in. You're going to at this stage, panic and say, why did I do what he told me to do? I've ruined my chair. Courage. The finish won't look good until you wrap it up with the overcoat later on. It's dead flat. You can see through it because it's not a second coat. Be patient. It'll look great when you're done. First coat of paint is dry. We're going to rub it down, smooth it a bit. Uh, it's just a, a tad rough. And my favorite abrasive for doing this is a toughy pad. You can use triple art steel wool if you want, but that leaves behind a whole lot of, of little tiny metal dust that you have to clean up afterwards. So this is my favorite. By the way, as I do this, you'll notice a couple of things. I did not paint the bottom of the seat, and I didn't paint the bottom of the arm rail. The old guys didn't either. When painting a chair by hand, they did not invest any time in an unseen surface. Finishing all surfaces of the chair came about in the 20th century with the development of spray finishes. Before that, if it wasn't seen, it wasn't painted. And as a tip of my hat to the old guys, for whom I have a great deal of respect, I finished my chairs the same way they did. We've rubbed down the chair, and I'm now going to put on the second coat of paint. A couple of tips on drying the chair. If you have a breezy day in the 
summer or springtime, you can put the chair outside in a sheltered area uh, out of direct sunlight. You don't want direct sunlight on the chair. And that will speed up its drying. In the winter, in a heated space, the drying takes place very fast. So what you've got with milk paint is a finish that can easily be done in a day. Um, the better part of a working day because of the drying time, but it's a finish that takes um, a relatively short amount of time to do. Now, the first coat sealed the wood. And so applying the second coat is much more like using latex or oil paint. Again, you don't exactly flow it on, but you don't have to work it as much as you did for the first coat. You'll get some brush strokes this time, but they flatten out as the, as the paint dries. Don't forget to stir the paint regularly so that those solids don't fall to the bottom of the jar. Second coat is dry. Chair looks a lot better than it did after the first coat, but it's still nothing to write home about. It's dead flat, and that's the way raw milk paint is. It's like chalk. We're going to seal the milk paint, and we're going to bring out a luster in it by applying a coat of wiping varnish, also called wiping poly. This is clear satin. It's got just a little bit uh, more flat finish than the shiny, bright, uh, uh, high gloss finish. I'm going to decant the poly into a paper cup. Here's why. The opening in which I would have to pour any surplus or any extra is very small. The cup gives me a perfect lip to do that with. Well, this is a lot faster than painting the chair because you're just brushing this stuff on and we're gonna wipe it off afterwards. The only thing I'm concerned about is covering every bit of the surface. Okay, I've got the Chair saturated now, covered with the uh, polyurethane, and I'm going to wipe it off. Uh, I'm going to do it fairly quickly before it begins to set up. I'm using an inexpensive face cloth. You buy the packages of these at Walmart, and you can just throw them away afterwards. Now all I do is wipe off the excess. Okay, I've wiped it down. <clears throat> the poly is the one element that's going to take time to dry. This will require overnight. The first layer of wiping varnish has now dried. And the chair has this characteristic matte finish. If you wish the chair to be more shiny, you can simply add a second coat of wiping varnish and that will give it gloss. I leave the chair this way because right now it is a blank tableau ready to record the history of your interaction with your chair. 
as you use your chair, it's going to change. It, some of the change will be predictable, and some of it will be unique to the chair. The chair is going to come in contact with your body. And when it does, just the friction of your clothing and your hands on the chair will begin to polish the milk paint in those locations. As you use the chair and create even more friction, you'll begin to cut through the finish and the wood underneath will be exposed. That will grow over the decades as the chair is used. The chair develops places that will be shinier than others. The matte finish will remain, but where you're in contact with the chair, it will begin to polish and the wear will begin to become more interesting and evidence of a chair that has been used and, by, and been loved by its owner. This continues, this process continues through not only the decades, the centuries. This is one of the things that fascinates me about milk paint. One of the reasons I like it so much is it's never done. Through the decades, through the centuries, it is going to be continually change as you record and your descendants and people after you record their interaction with the chair. The places where you're in contact become shiny highlights and the wear pattern continues to grow. So the chair never stops. It just keeps getting better and better with use thanks to that milk paint finish. Thank you for watching this content. I hope you enjoyed it. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe to this channel. And check back frequently for more Windsor chair making tips and tutorials.